welcome to our Solutions for Nano Analysis podcast brought to you by Bruker Nano Analytics. We look forward to bringing you a new podcast regularly. My name is Cody Morton. I'm a marketing communications specialist at Bruker Nano Analytics and an information enthusiast. If you like to learn from specialists in their field and hear what technologies are solving their problems, you will enjoy this podcast. Every session, we will focus on a different problem that our colleagues face in the lab and in the field. Some of the solutions will be a variation of ideas you may have heard before or even worked with. We will bring you these topics in a new and interesting way and introduce you to updated and thought-provoking results. We will talk about how the problem was dealt with in the past and what we're doing to solve the problem now and perhaps even envision future solutions. Join us as we talk solutions with a variety of scientists and technicians in many different industries in the Solutions for Nano Analysis podcast. Today, we are talking about the advancements being made by Simplicity Delivering Affordable Science. We are happy to discuss the addition of our EBSD detectors to benchtop SEMs with some terrific results. Join us while we talk about how labs with the limited resources can get outstanding results. To talk about this new technology, welcome our EBSD product manager, Daniel Gorin. Daniel acquired his PhD at Metz University in France, and in 2009, he joined Bricker Nano Analytics as an application scientist. Since 2012, Daniel has been our EBSD product manager. Also joining us is Mike Tolson, a distributor for COSUM, a manufacturer of benchtop SEM systems. Let's talk about the EDXS for smaller benchtop systems. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Would you mind telling everybody who you are in the world? Thanks, Cody, for the invitation. Uh, so yeah, my name is Mike. I am the general manager for Element Pi. We are the the USA distributor for COSUM uh, scanning electron microscopes out of uh, South Korea. And uh, we've been uh, doing this since 2018. Terrific. And COSUM, for those that maybe have little background with them. Tell us more about that company and what they offer to their customers. Yeah, COSUM is one of three companies that got started in 2007 in South Korea as a result of a technology licensing effort by the Korean Research Institute for Science and Standards, which is CRIS. It's similar to the NIST here in the U.S., so they started brand new, brand new company, and all they they focus 100% on electron microscopes. And because of the way they were, because of the way they were started, their primary focus was cells in uh, Southeast Asia. And it wasn't in two, until 2017 that they decided to venture outside to other parts of the world, and and we got connected and uh, brought them to the U.S. So I. I notice, Mike, when I look at the COSUM images of the system itself compared to other SEMs I see in lab settings, it looks a lot smaller. Is that the case? Is it a smaller system? Well, it's certainly smaller than uh, you know floor model systems uh, that take up an entire room a lot of times because of all the power supplies and the other utilities that they require. But from a tabletop standpoint, uh, I think most of the tabletops on the market are all, they're all roughly about the same size, typically about uh, 16 inch by 24 inch footprint, or what's that be, 400 millimeters by 600 millimeters for those that prefer metric like me. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, they fit on standard desktops, so uh, everything. So, Who are the customers that most benefit from this size of system? Well, we have customers in just about every facet of research you can imagine from uh, obviously academic is a big area, but also in government and in industry. And over the last three years, I'd say the primary focus has been all related to energy. There's just so much research going on with uh, battery materials and everything associated with that. But we have we've had we've had people in aerospace, food science, uh, packaging materials, biology. I mean, just about you run the gamut of technical areas, and we've we've probably got a customer 
We haven't even have a customer that does equipment for uh, uh, root canals in dentistry, and they, and they they use our equipment for looking at the at the teeth, cadaver teeth, I guess, and they look at them for how how the how the equipment works, and they they make use of our they like our uh, mosaic or panorama feature because they they need to do low magnification images that they can Im- that they can zoom into, and so they, they we have a feature where you can actually create a large area image at high resolution, uh, we call it panorama. And they, 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 they like that and make use of it really well. Oh, that's really interesting. The COSUM is something that quality labs get a lot of use out of as well? Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, the, the big thing about these tabletop systems is that they serve a general, kind of more of a general purpose and quality control being one of those. So, you know, what's nice is it's a multi-user instrument because of its robustness. And multiple multiple users can bring samples. You know, an engineer has a problem out of the factory or whatever. They can bring a, a part in and, and look at it real quick to figure out what's going on. They don't have to wait. They, they can get immediate uh, immediate results. Uh, but yeah, we've got customers that are using it 24/7 for things in, in semiconductors uh, and a variety of different things where you know it's in a quality control lab and they're doing a measurement or something that requires an electron microscope, but it doesn't necessarily require a big microscope. So you know they, they probably got a big microscope in another research lab and then they can use the tabletop system to do you know the basic kind of imaging on a on a repeatable basis. So Daniel, what is the problem that we're solving today? Um, yeah so to answer your question, uh, I would like to say a few words about the product vision as to why we did this. And the reason why we developed this product and we launched this product is uh, because we believe we can contribute to the scientific and technological advancement. And uh, how we, we want to achieve that? It's by significantly decreasing the cost of EDS and EBSD. Entry-level uh, electron microscopes, either if they are tabletops or compact or standard tungsten ECMs, do not have EBSD is because EBSD technique has been until now very expensive. And that would, in certain cases, uh, if you add EDS and EBSD, it would triple the cost of the microscope or maybe more. And then, of course, makes it not very probable that a customer uh, with a limited budget would afford to add EDS and EBSD on their entry-level uh, microscope. It's not that much of um, a question of size of the detector or uh, weight of the detector. It's important, uh, that technical point. But it, it is mainly because of the economics. It's really an economical question. It is true that, let's say, if the, the, the cost or the, the commercial part of this uh, new product, it is very important. It represents maybe 80% of the entire picture. The size of the detector or the weight of the detector, it's also important because uh, usually EBSD detectors are very bulky and heavy. And if you install such a detector on a tabletop microscope, you will run into problems, let's say, because it might, it will really maybe not tilt the detector off the table, but uh, the the microscope off the table, but uh, it may not fit uh, onto the microscope. And with that in mind, we designed, we had to design a new EBSD detector with a different functioning principle because we had to make it really small and uh, simple to use and lightweight. So the detector is powered by a binning capable CMOS camera with a native resolution of 720 by 540 pixels. It can do any binning from two by two up to six by, by six. And no matter the binning mode, it can reach a maximum speed of 520 frames per second. We were talking earlier about the dimensions or, and the weight of it. And here you have a picture uh, just to have a, a reference as to how small it is. It's next to a Brooker ballpen. So it's uh, 3.3 approximately inches long and uh, less than two inches in diameter. 
and it weighs less than a kilo. And also uh, extremely important, it is a true plug and play device. You can, you, you tra uh, it tra the power transfer and data transfer is done through a USB 3 cable. So it connects plug and play into a computer. Uh, you only need a USB 3 port on the computer side. Like uh, all Brooker EBSD detectors, it has a user replaceable fossil screen and um, it has a user removable detector head uh, with a special slide in, slide out mechanism. So you can take that, uh, remove it from the rest of the detector and free up the chamber, the ACM chamber. And last but not least, it has a special custom made optic system with a field lens uh, to maximize light throughput. So Daniel, when you're looking at this size versus the full size EBSD that Bruker offers, is it, it's less than half the size, isn't it? Um, or, it's way more than that. Um, I was just is, yes, is um, at least uh, one order of magnitude. So at least 10 times smaller. Uh, I, I don't have a, a picture to really show um, the XS next to a standard EBSD detector, uh, but I do have a picture. People maybe have seen the EM30, the tabletop ACM from Coxum, and uh, you can see the EBSD detector. It's really, really tiny. Yeah, now the small detector, the XS, is that something that's only available on the smaller scopes? Yeah, that's a very good question. This um, special functioning uh, principle, which I mentioned earlier, we, which we had to uh, implement in this new detector, it means it does not have a insertion retraction mechanism. And for that reason, we're related to the physics of uh, optics and focal distances. And so this detector is optimized for SEMs with small chambers and medium sized chambers. The so, uh, tabletop being one of them. Okay. So how does the software then compare with the excess versus uh, what are we calling it? The full size or the original? Yeah. yeah. That's a very important point. Uh, typically, uh, when EDS or when EDS is installed on these entry-level microscopes, it comes with a basic uh, or a compact version of a software with very limited capabilities. We decided that that should not be the case uh, for this uh, product for Quantax EDXS, and Quantax EDXS. Uh, comes with uh, the EBSD detector that we just spoke about with a 30 square millimeter EDS detector, liquid nitrogen free SDD uh, with 129 EV manganese K alpha resolution. Uh, it has an element range from boron to americium and a fixed design, meaning the detector cannot be inserted or retracted. It's in the measurement position all the time. And in terms of software, it comes with the standard EDS capabilities and the full capabilities for EBSD. And this is our Esprit to main product uh, software. So this is really opening up the options for a lot of labs that aren't able to get maybe funding for a much bigger system, uh, universities, education labs, startup labs. Where do you see this technology going from here? Is it just going to keep getting smaller and smaller so that it's eventually a button you just put in there? Well, we're, we're not yet there. <laughs> uh, and uh, certainly uh, that will require effort, uh, not, on the, not that much on the hardware side, but on the software side to make the software more intelligent, take over some decision-making, for example, in the setting of the hardware before a measurement or deciding what kind of step size to use and so on. But we're not yet there. There are lots of, we are half the way there, let's say, but hopefully uh, soon 
we will see development or of features released in that uh, direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, but where we see this uh, going, uh, this product is the idea behind this product is to make the lab the uh, the the lab's resources to be used in the most efficient way possible. Uh, and here I have uh, four very important points or major benefits of this new product. So the major advantage of the uh, the new EBSD detector is that it will help lab managers to use their resources as efficiently as possible. And when I say this, I mean for all applications, all EBSD applications not requiring the spatial resolution of field emission ECM. Uh, so for materials having grain sizes or particle sizes, let's say larger than a half a micron, any that would be a routine analysis and all those measurements could be done with an entry level ACM, with a tabletop ACM using this new system of ours. Then training new users could now be done at much lower cost and time constraints. And this is particularly important for academia uh, where they get master students, uh, PhD students every year and they need to train them. And uh, if you have just one EBSD capable microscope in the lab and it's, uh, it costed a half a million or a million dollars to install, the, the constraints would be uh, really, really uh, large there. Then um, having such a affordable system in the lab would give, the lab managers could give more time to entry level users to practice EDS and EBSD. So again, for academia, it's very, very important uh, not just to give them, give these new users a, a session of training, but afterwards for them to take their time to practice and get good with uh, EBSD and EDS. And if uh, their applications require a powerful uh, high resolution ACM, they could go and do their measurements there, but only after they have become very proficient with uh, the techniques. And then last but not least, for those who have done EBSD already, they would know that sample preparation, uh, it's quite, let's say, demanding for EBSD. And therefore you don't, you may not get it right from the first shot. So such a system in, in the lab could be a very good way of checking the sample preparation quality before a user goes and keeps an expensive SEM busy uh, without risking to realize that the sample was not prepared well enough and then ruin that time on the, on the, on the expensive ACM. I think probably with the entry-level users, the sample prep is one of those skills that's very important to perfect early. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And then this is a very efficient way or affordable way to uh, give them time to uh, uh, have this iteration done, Pre- preparation, go check in the SEM, it's not good enough, go back to the preparation, do some more uh, final polishing, go back to the SEM, and you cannot do in a busy lab that with a, an expensive field emission SEM because the schedule is uh, sometimes booked at least two weeks in advance. While if you have uh, like a tabletop SEM retrofitted with EDS and EBSD, uh, you have a lot less uh, constraints, uh, time constraints, and uh, users could do that uh, and use that SEM, that facility for checking the sample preparation quality. So uh, Daniel is telling us all about adding EBSD to the system. How do you think that adding the EBSD EDXS to the COSUM system will help the COSUM customer? Yeah, so uh, first, uh, I guess, you know, I think the reason Daniel and uh, and Bruker got together with us is because we're we we're kind of in a unique position with our tabletop system. Our tabletop systems chamber is the only one on the market that has 
uh, multiple chamber chamber ports where you can access the inside the chamber. Mm -hmm. Normally, with a tabletop system, they have one chamber port, and that's used for the EDS detector. And so on uh, on the Cosm system, we actually have three ports: one in the front, or excuse me, one on the one on the left, the back, the the right, and the back. And of course, you've got the front is where the door is, the chamber door, and uh, which, which it's actually got. I guess you could call it a fourth because there's electrical feed through through the front door. But anyway, because we have that extra port on the side, we could we were able to figure out a way to mount the EBSD. So as far as the customers that would uh, benefit from this, I think it'll, grow, it'll primarily be in the, you know, the people that have asked about it in the past have been in mineralogy and metallurgy, looking at grain structures and, uh, you know, identification of minerals uh, because of their crystalline pattern. But we've also had people, you know, that are doing basic materials, fundamental re materials research, you know, in, in uh, crystals, crystallography, I mean, all kinds of new energy materials that are, that are also interested in in those kind of things. So, and they, they don't need, they don't necessarily need a high-end system to do that. Um, but especially, you know, especially in geology and metal, metal, metallurgy at the academic level, it's a great, I think it'll be a really, really great teaching tool for, uh, you know, students to learn how to use, how to use EBSD for those kind of, of analysis. And then, it's also it'll be a good stepping stone for people before they move up to a big expensive system that that a you know lab manager might not be crazy about allowing a new person on on their million dollar five hundred thousand dollar system they might be a lot more prone to letting them you know get their feet wet on a on a lower cost system first and get on getting to learning all the basics so that they're not utilizing a lot of expensive microscope time. Now, if someone already has a smaller system like a COSM system, is this something that they can add on or do they have to start from scratch again with their system? The answer is yes, uh, providing that port is, uh, this port here is available. This port was not designed for what we are using it for. So that port was designed for a stem aperture. In case the microscope uh, does not have uh, that stem aperture or that stem detector solution, then the port will be free and uh, they can use it uh, as is. Otherwise, they will have to take down that detector and install the ADS in EBSD. How will this technology change the way that labs work with their samples? Does this expand the type of sample they can run? or allow a more intense look at their current samples? Well, part of the product is EDS. So they might even have already EDS on the microscope. Uh, it is the EDS detector that is currently being sold with this microscope goes on a port which is uh, opposite on the chamber. So it's facing these two new detectors. So uh, there will be nothing different compared to that in terms of EDS. If they didn't have EDS, then they could do EDS now. And then in regards to EBSD, the, the two techniques, they are quite different. They are very different. They provide very different information. But uh, in many cases, it's a very powerful complementary information because there are certain types of analysis EDS alone cannot do and certain types of analysis EBSD cannot do. And uh, when you have an integrated system, there are certain synergies for specific applications where uh, the two techniques can help each other. For example, I can, go, I can give a few examples. You have titanium oxides, the two famous uh, polymorphs, the rutile and anatas, which chemically are identical, but crystallographically they are very different. So then EBSD would be able to separate absolutely no problem, those two phases, and then there are many metals uh, which have the same structure, which for EBSD will look identical or uh, will look very much the same, like copper, nickel, gold, silver, you name it, al aluminum. And then for EDS, they will be extremely different. So then you could use the EDS information to separate in an EBSD map uh, these phases, um, have, uh, creating very, very similar pattern, equity pattern. So to go back to your question, 
adding EBSD would most of the in in um, most of the benefit would be additional information and uh, to only part of very few some of the applications the customers have already looked at either with just microscopy or EDS EBSD would uh, simply add some extra information to that but otherwise there will be types of analyses which are not possible otherwise with either just electron microscopy or EDS alone. For example, that would be uh, grain size and shape statistics, which are more or less fully automated with EBSD and with this system. Daniel, do you have an example you can share with us using this EBSD technique? I have here an example of a map acquired from uh, commercially available aluminum foil So there was absolutely no sample preparation done. It's just the aluminum foil from the shop, from any shop on this planet. You can find aluminum foil. And then, so we acquired an EBSD map. And you can see here what we call the pattern quality map. And you can see these uh, parallel dark lines. These are practically uh, defects on the foil produced by the rolling process, uh, which is how the foil is obtained from uh, aluminum slabs. And, uh, and here is the orientation map where we can see that the grains, uh, the crystals in the aluminum foil have a preferred orientation. The fact that they are mostly blue or purple uh, and not just all the colors, that means the aluminum foil we can find in the shops have, a preferred, uh, have uh, microstructures with grains with a preferred orientation. And if we use this data, Uh, and ask the software to uh, reconstruct the grains, then we can obtain, it's fully automated, the process, uh, a map, and it takes a few seconds, a map that looks like this, where all the grains have been detected and they are colored with a random color so that there are no two neighbors with the same colors, simply to make them visible to to the human eye. And if we look at then at statistics, Here we have the grain size distribution where we have a nice peak to the left, let's say for grains smaller than four microns. And then some of these classes of uh, larger grains and one of them here, almost 13 microns in size. And there were 892 grains in this map and they have an average uh, grain diameter of 5.15 microns. And also, in the same time, you can also, uh, the software calculates the shape, the, the form of the grain. And you can have here a distribution of the uh, grain shape uh, with zero here, meaning infinitely flat, and one meaning a perfect uh, circle. So the, the grain looks like a circle, like a perfect circle. And you can see that there is a peak centered around six and a half to seven or 0.65 or 0.7, which means they are, some of the grains are a little bit flattened, but most of them are relatively echiax. So all these, uh, whatever I show you here, this is fully automated process. The user only has to click one button. Daniel, finally, as we're talking about this technology, who would benefit most in your opinion? with this size system and this new technology being offered? Thank you for that. It's a very, very important question. And I hope uh, I can make it crystal clear. The, the new product is intended for newcomers as well. Uh, that's clear for the part of the microscopy, electron microscopy market, which has not been served with EBSD until now, but it's not exclusive to that part of the market. It is also uh, intended for the existing EBSD users, for those users which, for, for big labs, for academia labs, for private industry, where they are already using EBSD. So they are only looking into making their uh, work more productive uh, or use their money uh, better, let's say. Mike? One last thought for you. It sounds like when you're working with the microscopes, time is money and larger system has a lot more time requirements. Does this play into the cost of ownership for your customers? 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's uh, when you look at the cost of ownership, you know, obviously big microscopes have a you know much, much higher uh, cost of ownership. So it's not only that, but then, you know, I did universities where they have a central core lab, you know, the departments have to rent time, on the, they have to reserve time first, which get it on the schedule, then they have to you know, go to the lab, which is always on the other side of campus and never fails. And, and you know, they're having to pay for that in some fashion. So uh, we've seen a lot of uh, the, the, you know, the, the academic departments decide, hey, let's put a tabletop in our department that we can use to cover, you know, 75% of the work that we need to do, do all of our, you know, upfront work here. And then when we're ready to do the final you know, really, you know, the high end analysis or imaging, well, then we'll go over and get on the big system. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's just been a, a, a gamut of different reasons for people to investigate that. Thank you to our speakers today. As an added bonus, Daniel has put together a comparison sheet for people that might be looking at adding a benchtop system to their lab. Stay tuned at the end of our podcast for more on this topic. If you would like more information about today's topic or to submit a topic idea, please email info.bna at bruker.com. You can also check out more information in today's show notes. A complete deck of information is available now in the notes for you to download on today's topic, including some results images and technical information. Join us next time as we look at a new solution with more scientists and technician in all sorts of industries. I believe you have some extra information prepared for those people that might be really serious about comparing costs, Daniel. Um, If I can uh, call it that way. And I prepared two slides where I would like to make, to clarify that uh, value for the money or that value proposition uh, we are making to these existing users. Here you can see a a table where we have um, different factors to consider and we compare the numbers of the EDXS, contacts EDXS on uh, EM30, the Coxim uh, tabletop, and most of the numbers refer to the EBSD uh, detectors. And then compare with a conventional EDS and EBSD system, uh, which usually goes on a field emission SEM. So if you compare the maximum speed, for example, for EBSD, that would be 520 for E-flash excess, and up to 5,000, oh, sorry, 4,500 uh, frames per second for a uh, latest generation CMOS uh, fast EBSD detector. Then if you consider doing EDS and EBSD simultaneously, then the EDS technique will slow down dramatically the, the speed at which you can map because you may want to have a good number of counts in every spectrum acquired in every point of the map. So then the maximum speeds would be around 100 points per second uh, for the EDXS and around 350 points per second for a conventional EDS EBSD system. Now, if we talk about, again, about EBSD, most maps have like a a quarter of a million, 300,000 pixels in them. But here I considered a very, let's say, generous situation where a user would want to acquire on a batch of 20 samples, for example, one map per sample, half a million points map. And how much time would that take? Would take uh, approximately 16 minutes with e- with e- flash excess and two minutes with uh, a very fast EBSD detector. So if you compare these two, uh, you see that you will be a lot more productive with a conventional EBSD detector. But now, if you consider, if you consider then an eight-hour work window per day, how many samples one could analyze in one day? And the difference is not uh, eight times uh, more samples because uh, you need to vent the microscope, exchange the sample, pump the chamber, 
and prepare the system to launch the next map. And that for, let's say, a reasonably uh, experienced technician would take, let's say, 10 minutes, maybe more, but let's say 10 minutes. And then that means with EDXS, a technician could acquire 18 maps or 18 samples, analyze 18 samples in eight hours, uh, and 40 uh, samples with a conventional ABSD system. But now, if we consider the cost of each of these systems, so if you normalize by the cost factor, then EDXS is at least four times, so it's a quarter of the initial inst- investment. And then if you normalize by that, then you actually, per dollar invested, you, pro- you are more productive than when you have a conventional CMOS CBSD detector. And you, it almost twice the productivity. So, so practically the, the takeaway messages are for low budgets or uh, organizations where uh, organizations which may not be willing to take high risk investment risks, then they could buy the EM30 with EDXS and that would provide them an integrated EDSCBSD capability at, the quor- uh, at one quarter the cost of a conventional solution. For those which are well-funded, for the same money, they could get four EM30 tabletops with EDXS, and that would give them twice the productivity. And in case one system fails, they will still be at 75% of capacity. While if you have a conventional system, and if the FCM is offline or the EBSD detector is offline, then you're at zero capacity, you're on uh, downtime. If this is not convincing enough, then I have a second slide where this time I consider not the initial investment, but the cost of ownership and downtime, because those are very often uh, not considered in the discussion. And I would like to emphasize it here. The eFlash XS was designed with reducing as much as possible the cost of ownership and the downtime. So due to detector complexity, uh, the detector complexity is very low. Reliability, it's very, very high for the flash excess. And the downtime, it's extremely, will be very, very low because we will have field replacement units. Practically, we will ship locally a replacement unit within days uh, which the user can then uh, swap with the failed unit uh, by themselves. And also, uh, what happens when the EBSD uh, screen gets damaged, which can happen? Uh, well, the user can immediately replace it with a spare screen when it comes to our system, to the XS system, while uh, if you have a CMOS uh, conventional EBSD detector, you have to ship the detector back to the factory for a very expensive repair and that's because the screen is fiber coupled with the CMOS chip in the camera. So when you consider these uh, important factors, and, and also the, a spare screen, it's $1,500. I don't know the, how much it will cost to ship to the factory and to uh, have the screen uh, uh, replaced basically. Uh, and also uh, add to that the downtime uh, this would be a very, very much, much higher cost of ownership compared to the eFlash XS solution.